Uncontrolled extreme wildfires are inevitable. These are the conditions when wildland urban interface disasters occur. The hundreds to thousands of houses destroyed during the wildfire. Does that mean that the wildland urban interface disasters are inevitable as well? No. We have great opportunities as homeowners to prevent our houses from igniting during wildfires. Most of our perceptions are that these big wildfires are something we can't do anything about. They're overwhelming. If huge organizations can't control the wildfire, how is it that somehow I can do something to my house to keep it from burning down? It's not a matter of controlling the wildfire. It's a matter of changing those conditions of the house and its immediate surroundings. There's a lot that we can do to the little things to our house and its immediate surroundings in order to reduce the ignition potential of that house. I'm going to do an assessment on this house for its ignition vulnerabilities. The assessment is what all of us homeowners can do. Currently, we're not in fire season, but it's getting hot and it's getting dry. So this is a perfect time before the smoke's in the air to do this assessment. The great opportunity we have as homeowners is that we can do the little things around our house to keep our home from igniting. We can actually separate our house from the extreme wildfire. We don't have to rely on the control of the extreme wildfire in order to keep our house from burning down. Over the last 30 years, my colleagues and I have done research involving laboratory experiments, field experiments, and post-fire disaster assessments to, to quantify and qualify the relationship between a wildfire and a destroyed home. What we found is that the high-intensity flames more than 100 feet away from the house are largely incapable of igniting the house directly. But it's the little things that seem to be destroying the houses. The burning embers, the, we call them firebrands, lofted out of the high intensity wildfire to land in the community, sometimes directly on houses as well as the surroundings. It's not 100 foot flames, it's a pile of firebrands that would fit in the palm of our hand. So my colleagues and I designed a firebrand, an ember shower demonstration. We have a full-size house. It's got bark mulch and pine needles around the base. It's got pine needles in the rain gutters. It's got pine needles on the roof. We have an ember generator that then casts a brand blizzard at this house. In order for those firebrands to be effective in igniting the house, they either have to ignite the house directly or they have to ignite something around the house that then can spread to the house. The main factors determining this home's ignition potential are right here. The home's characteristics related to its immediate surroundings. For our assessment, our perspective changes to this house being one of fuel for the potential ignition. Look around your house and see where the litter, the leaves and the needles have piled up and visualize that that's going to be where firebrands begin to pile up and, and collect. So here we have pine needle litter right up next to the house. It's on the steps, it could ignite and start this wall and step area on fire. It also can ignite on this lathing, which is right up underneath the wood shingle siding, and ignite that. This doesn't burn with high intensities. It burns with low intensities, but it's extremely important. 
In fact, on this house, it easily could be the critical factor that leads to its total destruction. If this house had rain gutters, this litter would be in the rain gutters, potentially igniting and putting flame right up at the eave line, potentially igniting the roof and going into the attic. On this side of the house, what our attention should be on is this gable vent. It's the most exposed kind of vent. I noticed that it's got fine mesh screen, which certainly helps keep large firebrands from going into the attic and potentially igniting this house. One of the things we looked at were vents during the brand blizzard. The brands are directly impacting that vent opening. The burning brands can blow right into the attic and potentially ignite the material that's in the attic. The remedy is simple. All we have to do is use finer mesh screen to cover the openings. One of the important aspects that we demonstrated was that you don't have to have a metal roof in order to keep the house from igniting, from firebrand. What we showed was that any roof that doesn't ignite and spread fire can survive the brand blizzard. So as we previously demonstrated, composition shingle roofs with pine needles on them don't represent a significant ignition problem. But look here, we've got a wood-sided wall coming down to the top of the roof where this needle deposition, when it ignites, is going to put flame contact right on the side of the wood wall. This results in flame contact and high ignition potential resulting in the destruction of this house. The house includes more than just itself if there are outbuildings that are close enough to ignite and spread to the house. So maybe we have a shed or we've got a chicken coop which then can burn long enough to ignite the shed that's next to that which then ignites and burns sufficiently in order to ignite the house. So we need to be as concerned about the surroundings of our outbuildings and their condition as we do our house. I looked into landscaping, I looked into fireproof home building, I looked into fireproof uh, lawn furniture. I mean, I was going for everything that I could for the safest fire safety you could. And we had a checklist. No fire would stack next to the house. All of our lawn furniture was fire rated. I wanted to feel like if there was a fire, we had the absolute best chance possible of us and our house surviving. So some of the little things that begin to get a house during a, an extreme wildfire from the firebrands are, for example, something as simple as a broom being left out. Flammable deck furniture, where we've got flammable cushions on, on the furniture on the deck next to the house. The cushions ignite from the firebrands, they ignite the deck railing which is connected to the house. We put three foot of uh, rock siding all the way around up the house as well as in our landscaping three feet out of crushed rock. We talked to people, all it took was one thing, a fire, firewood stacked in the wrong place or lawn furniture caught fire on their porch. One tiny little technique that wasn't followed. Well, knowledge is key. The more you know, the more you can increase your chances, and not always does that have to cost money, right? It's just knowledge. It's still a shock to go through a fire, but to come back and see your home, right, that's such, an, uh, such a good feeling.
Flame contact on the house is a really bad idea. So what we want to make sure of is that we don't get flame contact on the house. We don't have a fire burning across pine needle litter, for example, and making direct contact with the house. But that only takes five feet around the house in order to keep the flames away. Let's take a look at the surrounding area of the house. Adjacent to this wood wall, we've got these green shrubs. So the question is, are these green shrubs a big problem and do they have to be removed? Well, as long as we've got green foliage without dead material, we're pretty good. But if we take a look, we've got dead material in the canopy and we've got dead material deposited under the wood wall. What we wanna do to keep the shrubs is to prune out all the dead material within the canopy as well as underneath in order to keep the wall and the shrubs from igniting. So we don't need to put out all the fires. We don't need to make sure that no fire occurs within the neighborhood. We do need to make sure that there isn't high intensity fire within 100 feet and we want to make sure that surface fire doesn't come directly to the house and ignite it. We definitely can't have a flammable wood roof on our house. It's the most susceptible to firebrand ignitions. But there are many things that occur on a seasonal basis. Cleaning up the litter around the base of the house, out of the rain gutters, making sure that we've swept the deck of, of pine needle litter and leaves, and making sure that our firewood piles aren't on the deck, and making sure that we've cut the grass and, and not having things right up next to the house that can burn. We've just taken a look at this home, but it's obvious that every home and every property are going to be different. That's why it's very important for us to seek information so that we can find the vulnerabilities to ignition of our own homes. Remember, if your home doesn't ignite, it doesn't burn. You've got to act now to address these little things long before the fire ever starts. <laughs>